Welcome to Daylight Savings Time Sunday, and if you intended to be at the early service and here you are at this one, no one's asking. We're just glad you made it. We're trying to be that ice cream truck. We're trying to bring joy and lighten the loads and brighten the days of people as we see them throughout our day. In fact, we're trying to brighten the day and lighten the load of a hundred people over a 40-day period. We began in February. You can start whenever you want, but the idea is to help a hundred people by just going the extra mile with them. And we're asking you even to share your experiences at 100 happy people at oakhillschurch.com. We're getting some wonderful emails. Some are heartwarming. Some make us chuckle. Here's one. My wife works at the athletic office at UTSA with students who are work study or graduate assistants. They perform what she describes as grunt work for little pay. All of them miss the comforts of home, so my wife invited them over for dinner last Sunday night. At the end of three and a half hours, we were saying goodbye to seven very happy people. But now the dilemma. Does my wife get to count all seven since it was her idea and she prepared the meal? Can I count them too? Since I contributed by paying grocery and other bills necessary to host the dinner, is that double dipping? We could claim three apiece and do rock, paper, scissors to see who gets the seventh person. We will continue to seek opportunities to make more people happy regardless of your decision. We formed a committee to evaluate this question. No, the challenge is simple. Develop your unselfish muscle by intently and purposefully dedicating 40 days to create healthy habits of helping other people. Many of you are posting your experiences on hashtag 100 Happy People on Twitter. Others of you are sharing your experiences with your neighborhood groups and your friends and your family. I encourage you to keep a journal and keep up with some of these. In fact, I'd like to invite you to send your experiences to us at 100 happy people at oakhillschurch.com. Someday I might write a book and include that story along with others about the way our church tried to make 100 people happy over a 40-day period. It's just a good exercise. We're using scriptures to help us in this process, each week looking at a different one another passage. In this week, we find ourselves in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve God one another. We're going to look at that passage in just a moment. I apologize for my hoarse voice. You should have heard it last Tuesday. It's pretty good by now, but if you can bear with it, so can I. Let's pray together, and then we'll get to work. And so, Lord, here we are again needing your blessing and understanding just to be more and more like you. You did not come to be served, but you came to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. That's very countercultural to us, but we pray that you'd help us to imitate you. Forgive our speaker today. His sins are many. Help us to see Christ, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray, and all the church said. I remember him as a large man, concrete block of a fellow. He wore a crew cut. A short-sleeved white shirt, a narrow black tie, and he had an ever-present pocket protector. He taught a midweek Bible class for 10-year-olds in Odessa, Texas, at the Parkview Church of Christ. I was one of his students. The classroom was built large enough to hold 20. There are at least that many in many desks. I can only remember at most four of us. It was a sleepy class. 
He was prone to stumble over his words, stare at his notes. I don't remember him as very enthusiastic, just very earnest. I don't remember anything else about him. To be honest, I don't remember his name. I don't know if he was a plumber or if he was a postman. But what I do remember with surprising detail is the evening of February the 10th, 1965, in which he set out to teach that group of four-year-old boys the significance of the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. Romans is a difficult book for the most mature believer. And the seventh chapter of the book of Romans describes the civil war of the soul where the apostle Paul talks about the ongoing struggle we have to do what is right, but then he declares at the end, really the beginning of chapter 8, the grace of God. It's a wonderful chapter, yet it's not easy to comprehend. And I did nothing that night to make the teacher think that I got it. I don't remember asking any questions, and I sure didn't go up to him after the class and thank him for his hard study. I'm sure he went home thinking, well, that was a wasted effort. If his wife asked him how the class went, he probably said something like, I don't know. Those kids never talk. (laughs) What he had no way of knowing is that that kid on the second row, the redhead with the freckles, he was listening. And I went that night after the service into my father's room, found my father in the restroom shaving, and asked my dad about forgiveness, about heaven. And my dad stopped what he was doing, and he sat with me on his bed, and we had a talk about Jesus. And I became a Christian that night. My dad baptized me the following Sunday, February 14th, as it turns out, Valentine's Day. I've thought much about that teacher in my life. I thought about whatever happened to him. Have any, did he have any way of knowing? I thought about what made him do what he did. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't dynamic. I don't think he ever wrote a book or started a church. Maybe he left a bunch of money to some organization somewhere, but I never heard about it. Never seen him since. But then again, I've seen him a thousand times over. At least people like him. Quiet servants, quiet servants, they don't seek the limelight, they just seek to do what's right. They show up, they unlock doors, they stack chairs, they pray for the sick, they care for the poor, they deliver meals. Most of them are not interested in being in front of people. Quite often, that's the last place they want to be. They would never want to stand behind a pulpit, but they're happy to make sure the pulpit's there. And they don't want to wear a microphone, but they'll make sure the microphone is turned on. They just want to serve the quiet servants of the church. It's about people like this that the passage is written that the apostle penned at the end of chapter 5 in the book of Galatians. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. This passage appears at the end of of a book about liberation. That's why Paul says you have been called to liberty. For five chapters, Paul talks about how we are free from sin or free from guilt and then free from rules and then free from regulations and then even free from expectations and free from religion. 
But then he says, now, but don't use this liberty as an excuse for self-promotion or self-indulgence. Quite the opposite. Use your newfound liberty as motivation to voluntarily indenture yourself to other people. Since you're free from rules and regulations, then serve with joy. Make yourself a servant of others. There are a few people in the Bible who really model this, and then there are two who really didn't. Let's look at a couple who do and then a couple who didn't. If you like to fill in the blanks, let's look at the portraits of servanthood. Andrew would be one of these. Andrew the apostle. When we think about apostles, Andrew is not the first name that comes to our mind. In fact, when you see the list of apostles in the Bible, the name Andrew is never at the top. Andrew was from the same town as James and John. Andrew was a brother to, anybody know? Peter, Peter. When you think of the inner circle, you think of those three, Peter, James, and John. But you don't think of Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Andrew was in the background. In the photo of the apostles, Andrew is on the side with his hands in his pocket. Peter's right in the middle. Well, maybe he's not in the photo. He's probably holding the camera. He was a servant. He was a quiet servant. But just because he didn't demand the limelight, that didn't mean he didn't have an inner fire. He sought out John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist pointed James and John and Andrew to go find the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Andrew went. Andrew went, and he and John became some of the first disciples of Jesus. But Andrew didn't stop there. Andrew, even though John went on to write epistles, even though John went on to write his gospel, even though John went on to write the book of Revelation, Andrew did none of that, but he did something equally important. He went and he found his brother, the Scripture says. He took his brother to meet Jesus. Who was that brother? Peter. Peter would go on to preach the first gospel sermon. Peter would go on to lead the Jerusalem church. Peter would go on to be a minister to the Gentiles. Peter would defend the apostle Paul. Peter would become a great proclaimer of grace. Any of us who appreciate the grace of Christ can appreciate Peter. But any of us who are indebted to Peter are really indebted to whom? Andrew, because in the sovereign linkage of chain links, Andrew is right there, the quiet servant who brought his brother to meet Jesus. Just a servant, like Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus. We're We think of Mary, and we think mother of Jesus. But really, Scripture, when Scripture refers to Mary, Mary refers, is referred to as the servant, the servant of God. What's most impressive about Mary is her unimpressive resume. Were you to meet Mary before she was the mother of Jesus, you wouldn't ask her about her jewelry You wouldn't be impressed with the house in which she lived. Uh, You wouldn't be intimidated by her bloodline or her ancestry. The most extraordinary thing about Mary was her ordinariness. On the social ladder of her day, Mary held to the lowest rung. Since she was female, she was subservient to the males. Since she was a younger woman, she responded or answered to the older women. And since she was a younger woman of poor economic status, 
uh, she was in the lower class, not the upper class. And since she was in the lower class, out in the podunk town of Nazareth, out in the outskirts, you'd find it'd be hard pressed to find anyone on the planet further down the pecking order than Mary. Of all the people in the world, of all the women in any generation that God could have used to be the mother to Jesus, why did he choose Mary? The only possible answer we are given comes from the words of Mary herself who said, I'm the servant of the Lord. May it be, or let this happen to me, as you say. You know, when God wants to bring Christ into the world, he looks for servants. Your pedigree doesn't matter. No diploma is required. Heaven doesn't check your bank account. God just looks for servants. So let all simple people be encouraged. God can use someone just like you. Let all proud people be cautioned. God would correct someone like you. At least he did correct James and John when the mother of James and John came with this outlandish request. Matthew 20, verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> then the mother of Zebedee's sons, that's James and John, <clears throat> came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Do you ever think the disciples just quit listening to Jesus? This is Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 20 are dedicated to the theme of humility. Jesus begins Matthew 19 by telling people, imitate children in their humility. <clears throat> then he talks to the rich young ruler and tells the rich young ruler to quit trusting riches and to trust him. And then at the end of Matthew chapter 20, he says the last will be first. And the first will be last. Then he predicts his own death, burial, and resurrection for the third time. But do any of the disciples come up and say, Jesus, tell us about humility or tell us about your death, burial, and resurrection? No. It just goes over their heads. What happens is the mother of Jesus, I'm sorry, the mother of James and John approaches Jesus with this request. Jesus says, You don't know what you're asking. He says that to James and John. James and John say, oh, yes, we do. They say, we really want to be on the right hand and on the left hand. It's not enough that they're apostles. It's not enough that they've seen miracles. It's not enough that they were in the inner circle and witnessed Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's not enough that they've had the privileges that they've had. They want more. They want Mount Rushmore to have the face of Jesus and then the face of James and then the face of John. They just want more credit. Spiritual ambition always does. Spiritual ambition always wants more applause, more titles, more recognition, more rewards. And so Christ firmly corrects them and us by giving them and us this, the principle, the principle of servanthood. He says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let these words be chiseled over the entryway to every church. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus was called and content to be called a servant. What relief. Well, we don't have to win everybody's approval. We don't have to climb to the top of any ladder. We are hereby released from the rat race of humanity. 
But we don't have to get to the top. If you want to be like Jesus, there's plenty of room at the lower level. Just be a servant. Whoever wants to be like Jesus, let him become a servant. Let him become like Andrew. Let him become like Mary. Let him be like Jesus. Jesus didn't carry a business card, I don't think. But had he carried one, it would have said, Jesus Christ, servant of humanity. What if you took that role in your house? Servant of the household. That's me, servant. Now, what if you took that role at church or at your work? What if your main goal every day when you woke up and went onto the school campus was, who can I serve today? What would that look like? How does that change the way we live? Well, a couple of interesting points come out of this verse. Let's look at the practice of servanthood. What does a servant do? How does a servant behave? Well, first of all, servants shift their expectations. They shift their expectations. The Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. So Jesus did not come with the expectation that anyone was going to serve him. Hello. A servant shifts his or her expectations. They wake up every day not assuming that they're going to be served, but seeking opportunities to serve. Once upon a time, there were two men, a man by the name of Mo and a man by the name of Joe. Mo loved to be served. Joe loved to serve. And when you contrast their two lives, what a difference you see. Mo woke up every day thinking, who's going to serve me? Who's going to bring me some coffee? Who's going to take care of me? Who's going to notice me? Who's going to applaud me? Mo had high expectations. Mo expected everyone in the traffic to move out of his way. Mo expected every flight to be on time for him. Mo expected the restaurant to give him the best table. Mo expected the parking lot attendant to remember his name. Mo expected everyone at work to cater to his plans. And if anybody asked too much, Mo was not very happy. In fact, Mo often went to bed at night grumpy because his goal was to be served. And since his goal depended upon other people serving him and he couldn't control that, he often felt like he had had a poor day. Mo expected to be applauded, to be recognized, to be acknowledged to be rewarded, and he was never acknowledged, recognized, or rewarded enough. That's why Mo's name and the word miserable start with the same letter. Mo was miserable. Joe had a different approach. That's why Joe's name and the word joy start with the same letter. Because the first thought Joe had every day when he woke up was, who can I serve today? He served his spouse coffee. He served his kids with kindness. Now, when he drove to the convenience store, it didn't bother him if the clerk was cranky. He wasn't there for her to serve him. He was there to serve her. Traffic bad, that's okay. He'll get out of the way and serve people. Just another opportunity to serve. Didn't bother him if the weather was messy or the flights were backed up. The world didn't exist to serve him. He existed to serve them. Parking lot attendant doesn't know his name, doesn't even cross his mind. He's trying to learn the parking lot attendant's name. The guys at work need help? Good. That's what I'm here to do, he thinks. And at night, he would go to bed thinking, wow, what a wildly successful day I've had. I was able to serve all day long. Mo was always miserable. Joe was always joyful. Why? 
Because if you make your happiness dependent upon the way other people treat you, you're always going to be disappointed. But if you take the initiative and say, no, I'm going to be the one who serves first, you're going to be like Jesus. And you're going to find the secret to joy. To joy. So my question to you is, are you more a Mo or a Joe? Maybe you're a Mojo. Somewhere in between. The secret to joy is giving it away. So few people get this that we wonder why more don't. But the happiest people are those who have the fewest expectations. Because those people are never disappointed. Shift your expectations. And then something else Jesus teaches us here that servants do. Servants not only shift their expectations, servants know their unique assignments. They know their unique assignments. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and look at this, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That was a unique assignment to Jesus Christ. I couldn't do that. You couldn't do that. The only one who could do that was Jesus Christ. He did what was uniquely assigned to him. Don't think that a life of servanthood is a life with no definition, a life that just moves haphazardly, randomly, from whatever needs to be done to whatever needs to be done. A life of a servant says, now what is my unique role? What can I do best, and where can I do it the most? How can I serve most efficiently? The Apostle Peter said, if anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability with which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. At the end of his life, there were still hungry people to feed. There were still sick people. There were still lonely people. Yet at the end of his life, Jesus said, it is finished. (laughs) What was finished? Well, the unique assignment given to Jesus was finished. The assignment of serving as ransom or the redeemer of the world. What's your unique assignment? You see, to be a servant is not a title, it's an attitude. You can still be the CEO, but be the CEO with a servant's attitude. You can still be a general, a four-star general. Who wouldn't want a four-star general who had a servant's attitude? You can still be the coach. You can still be the quarterback. You can be the leader, but you can be that with a servant's spirit. So what is your unique assignment? Determine that, couple that with a servant's attitude, and you've got the combination, the dosage of a life like Christ. In post-World War II, much of Europe was decimated by the bombings. The social structures of the major cities were undone. They simply didn't have the capacity to take care of the families that were in need. As a result, many orphans roamed the large streets of Paris and and Berlin and London. An American soldier came across an orphan on the streets of London in the days after World War II. He was walking down the street, walking through all the rubble of the bombed buildings. When he noticed a young boy, maybe eight or nine years of age, disheveled and dirty, standing in front of the window of a bakery. Over the boy's shoulder, the soldier could see inside the bakery, and he could see the baker kneading the dough that was about to be turned into donuts. And the soldier could almost hear the boy's lips smacking. He went up and stood next to the boy and said, Son, would you like one of those? And the boy looked up at the soldier and said, Would I ever? So the soldier went inside and he bought a dozen donuts, put them in a box, brought them out, and gave the box to the little boy. And he turned to leave And the little boy came up behind him and tugged on the soldier's jacket. The soldier turned around and the boy looked up at the soldier and said, Sir, are you God? May we serve in such a way 
that little 10-year-old boys in Bible classes get to hear about God. And may we serve in such a way that, that people look at us and wonder if they've seen the presence of God. Amen? Thank you, Lord. May we do that, Father. May we be the kind of people who bring the presence of God into every circumstance in which we live. Forgive us, forgive me for expecting to be served. We resign from that role, <clears throat> and we volunteer to be a servant. We volunteer to be like Jesus, to lead lives in which we seek to serve and not be served. And grant that this week we can make people happy as we serve them. And we know in doing so, we'll make ourselves happy as well. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, amen, amen. amen.